Soup might seem like an irrelevant topic right now in light of global events, but borscht is a huge part of Ukrainian identity. It's so symbolic to their culture that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine has used borscht as a form of gastro diplomacy in the past by featuring at its London embassy. So while soup might not seem like the best weapon, borscht has become key in Ukraine's fight for cultural acknowledgement. So why does the Western world think borscht is Russian? What historical evidence supports Ukraine's claim to borscht? And what is the secret to great borscht? I hope you're ready, because this tale gets twisty. Many different cultures and countries across Eastern Europe and Northern Asia enjoy this hearty dish. But when it comes to Ukraine, borscht isn't just well-loved. The country's national dish is also intertwined with its history and a long conflict with Russia. Before we get into the nitty-gritty specifics, let's explore this delicious dish. While it has humble beginnings, it's not your weeknight one-pot meal. What makes it a tricky soup to prepare is that you can't just throw everything in at once and let it cook. The secret to a great borscht is adding ingredients at the right times so that their individual flavors combine perfectly. Part of what makes borscht so wonderful is that it's versatile. It can be served hot or cold, with or without meat, and it can be white, green, or red. You can count on each Ukrainian family having their own favorite recipe. But the hearty beet red borscht is the most widespread. Its ingredients are easy to find. Beets, cabbage, and potatoes are staples. You can also add beans, carrots, and meat. Herbs like dill and parsley add tasty notes. With all the variety, it shouldn't surprise you that borscht has evolved a lot over the years. Just how far back can it be traced? The very first borscht originated between the 5th and 9th centuries. This soup wasn't as hearty. It was a broth cooked with non-poisonous cow parsnip. This plant is also called, wait for it, Borshevik, or in English, hogweed. In the 17th century, ethnic Ukrainians, then under Russian rule, added beets. The iconic red borscht was born. So why does most of the West think that borscht comes from Russia? Well, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine has been happening ever since the mid-17th century. Part of Russia's attempt to control Ukraine has been to oppress its culture. Because if you get rid of a people's language, heritage, and food, then they're much less likely to fight for independence. You can see this clearly in the 20th century. In 1921, Ukraine was occupied by the Russian Red Army and became part of the Soviet Union. Under this rule, Ukrainians suffered greatly. In 1932, Joseph Stalin's plan to force all farmers to work for the state resulted in a man-made famine, now known as the Holodomor. Millions of Ukrainians starved to death. Under his policy of collectivization, Stalin ordered his unofficial commissar of food, Anastas Mikoyan, to create a national cuisine of the Soviet Union. In 1939, the results were published in the Book of Tasty and Healthy Food. This propaganda-heavy cookbook took recipes from Soviet republics and grouped them all under the singular culture of the Soviet Union. Several borscht recipes are included, but even here the entry for red borscht is labeled Ukrainian borscht. Yet Westerners tend to group all Soviet states into one entity, meaning Russia. Which is why you might have thought that borscht is a Russian soup. And the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs has only tried to bolster the misbelief that borscht has always been from Russia with tweets like this claiming the dish as Russia's own. But Russia does have its own version of borscht. It's called xi. This dish uses sauerkraut instead of fresh cabbage. It can be difficult to unwind the history and culture of neighboring countries, but it's important that we do just that. Which brings us back to borscht diplomacy. Connecting borscht specifically to Ukraine helps affirm that it's a country with its own distinct heritage. And despite the fact that its land and people have been historically oppressed, their spirit and customs have persisted. If you want to help the people of Ukraine, please donate below. Every bit counts. See you next time on another episode of Origins of Food.